So today we talked about augmenting machine and human intelligence with data visualization. And the interesting thing is that data visualization is so interdisciplinary that we talked about a range of projects and of visualization investigations, if you will, from science to uh, product to art and design, and really a, a wide uh, range of different perspectives for visualization. Each visualization project is different, uh, but I'd say that there's one theme they all share in common for us, which is it all start, starts from the data. So we basically will get some data set that we think might be interesting, and we'll start sort of having a dialogue with this data set where we're poking at it, we're trying to look at it from different perspectives, and sometimes um, the answer for what kind of technique we might want to use or which way we might want to transform the data comes out very naturally. Sometimes the poking goes on for a long time. So as we showed with the wind map, we were sort of at our wit's end with there. We were trying a lot of different um, ways to visualize that data set until we stumbled into one way that seemed to make sense. But this is something that happens a lot with data visualization. It's that you are constantly trying to navigate this kind of um, a mix of, of scientific um, perspective, but also what works from a design perspective? What works visually? Uh, what is a way that you can sort of tell a story with your data to your viewer? I think that one of the most exciting things about visualization today is just how ubiquitous it is. Um, Martin and I have been working with data visualization for a while now, and I feel like people were not nearly as widely exposed to data visualization as, as we are now. So for instance, the fact that you have newspapers doing news coverage with interactive visualizations, the fact that you can access visualizations on your phone and you can play with them, and the fact that because we've been exposing regular readers, if you will, regular viewers, not, not necessarily technical, to this wealth of visualization and data, I also feel like the literacy level uh, for dealing with data has gone up a little bit, which is really important. I feel like we want to have uh, consumers of data, critical consumers, consumers of data. And I think that the more they're exposed to these very sophisticated ways of dealing with data, the better it is. Like, you know, places like the New York Times will have these visualizations that a few years ago only existed in academic papers and were for scientists, but now they're showing it to their readers. Well, that's wonderful. You know, can we start democratizing this access to data and, and to sophisticated ways of visualizing it? How easy it is to connect with other people. Um, I'm from Brazil. When I came to the US, uh, it was really hard to talk to my family. I, you know, for me to get on the phone, it would cost me a dollar a minute to talk to Brazil. And today, we have WhatsApp, we have phone, we have texting, we have all sorts of different ways. We have Skype. Like, it's crazy, and it's all free. And it's it's like now I feel like I'm on the other side where I'm like, oh, wait, guys, wait, it's too much connection. It's too much texting. Can Just give me, be, give me a breather. And I would never have, never have imagined that we would be in, in, in a place where communication is so seamless and, and so immediate as it is today. I think machine learning is a big question mark. I think it's amazing technology, really empowering, and, and really uh, it, it changes the paradigm of what you can do with computation. Um, so it's, it, it just feels like we want more of it, and, and it's, it's, it's sort of like starting to get embedded into every aspect of, of our lives. Um, and that's great. I think it's going to be very freeing. Um, but I, because it's a shift in paradigm, I really think that we don't fully understand all the implications yet, and we don't even fully understand what does it mean to build a product uh, with with machine learning um, necessarily. So I think we're still uh, learning, 
what does it mean to work with this kind of technology? What are the limitations? What are even the questions we want to ask of this technology? And how can this technology be the most helpful to us? Um, one of the things that is really challenging, it's the fact that it's not always deterministic. So you don't know how it's going to behave all the time, right? Um, and that's, that's a, an opportunity, and it's also uh, a big um, challenge. So I think we need better ways of, of understanding the challenging parts there. Up to now, programming has been a lot about describing a world where you know all the rules, right? So if I want a system to, to do X, I'm going to give all the rules for the system to get there. That is good because we are in control, but that can also be exhausting because when you get to more complicated problems that you want to solve, you don't know all the rules. In fact, you don't even know how to solve the problem. So the idea of machine learning being freeing to me has a lot to do with the fact that we are now in this world, in this place where um, I may not know all the rules, but that's okay. I'm going to work with the system to make it learn. It's going to learn something, and hopefully it gets the results I want. But I'm not having to tell it all the time everything it needs to do or how it needs to do. Um, and that means that we can, we can um, sort of cover a wider range of possibilities um, and point this at, at different places we couldn't before. Thank you.